So welcome on this uh, first recording of meeting three. And I start again as in the first two meetings with an outline of everything we do. So the three parts of the whole course. And we've seen already part one in the first meeting, I introduced Homo economicus, mentioned the empirical problems and the beginning of solutions. That was the first meeting. The second meeting had behavioral theories with emphasis on theory. We discussed chapter four, behavioral theories for decision on the risk, chapter five, behavioral theories for intertemporal choice, and more to come. So today we continue with chapter six, behavioral theories for welfare, then a more fundamental breakaway from this uh, revealed per preference paradigm, choice-based data. And then part three will also be today, all kind of applications. Let's not read them, we will see them when we come to them. So let me now move on to page 165. There we are. We go to chapter six, behavioral theories for welfare. And I'm going to present to you the fear Schmidt model of inequality aversion. So that will be the first thing and the only thing in this chapter. There are other models, but we will keep, uh, we have to be short. So they introduced a welfare model that captures inequality aversion. And the paper was very, it's a very simple, but very tractable model capturing the main things. So very popular. It's one of the most cited papers in economics, their paper introducing it. So I will present it to you. And we assume a welfare allocation where we have n agents, and for instance, if it's the country, the Netherlands, where I am, then there will be almost 18 million inhabitants. So then there could be a welfare allocation over almost 18 million, n would be almost 18 million, but it can be whatever group. Xj is the welfare for agent j. So how should we evaluate how good or bad is it? Now I will put up a formula and a bit of a complex formula. I will explain it. Now, in this society, how happy is agent one? Imagine you are agent one, how happy are you? And this is a formula that we will use. The first term is simply how rich you are, simply your money. That will be the first term in this summation. Now the uh, experienced economic uh, listeners in the audience will probably immediately think, wait a minute, should we bring in utility? Should it be the utility of X1? And you can't ignore utility. And fish would say, well, we do ignore, we simply take you to the linear. And then you already see this is a very particular, very restricted model. Many phenomena that are interesting, important, such as diminishing margin utility, it cannot incorporate. So how can it be a good model? But it can still be, because although many interesting phenomena are not incorporated, also many uninteresting phenomena are not incorporated. And the trade-off of the good phenomena still incorporated versus the bad phenomena still incorporated, maybe quite good. So it can be restricted models can be still be quite useful. That's the case here, because some of the major phenomena of inequality aversion, the module is capturing quite nicely and well. So that's the explanation why it is so very popular and so very useful, although it's very simple. Anyway, we saw the first term, but there are more terms going on. And in this model, it is assumed that people dislike all kinds of inequalities. And let us look more in detail, into detail. Here, we look at the your agent one, right? Here, we look at all the agent J that are richer than you, that have more money than you do. So then you dislike it because you see this is a positive term. B1 is also positive, but here's a negative sign. So this decreases your happiness. That means if you uh, are agent one, you look around you and you see that your neighbor has more money than you do, you feel inequality aversion and a bit of uh, reduction of happiness comes in. So all these terms, uh, how much uh, people are richer than you, that makes this term bigger. But all these terms are multiplied by the positive B1. That B1 is a subjective parameter that captures your attitudes to it, your dislike of the inequality of version of being behind, when you are behind with other people. So those are, that are the, the terms here. Here we look at the inequality because of people who are poorer than you are. Now you can, in fact, imagine that things could go two ways. It could happen that if you see that your neighbor is poor, given you have a fixed wealth level, but then you discover that your neighbor is poorer than you, maybe you would derive happiness from it. You would say, oh, I'm, uh, at least I'm richer than that guy. Haha. <laughs> and so apparently I'm not doing so very bad. So you could derive happiness from it, but you can also can also reduce your happiness. It can see, given your world, that you say, oh, the poor man is poorer than me. That's inequality. That's uh, make me unhappy. I think people should all be equal. So 
you can, and that's what's assumed here because this is a positive term, you know, you are richer than that guy. So this is a positive term. A1 is positive, but here is negative. So the inequality terms for people who are poorer than you also reduce your happiness. And now A1 is now a parameter, it's again a subjective parameter, that's your aversion to inequality when you are ahead. How much unhappiness you get when you see other be people being poorer than you are. So let me write the things that I already said. Uh, you know, all the inequalities are decreasing welfare, that's what Feshmit assume. Then B1 and A1, I already explained them, they are subjective parameters. Now, in any, I write here inequality. And the idea of that inequality is that primarily your happiness is determined by simply how much wealth you have. And those inequality terms, they, they add to it, but not so much. But in total, there are n minus one, uh, at most n minus one terms. So then the total impact uh, on your well happiness should be less than the first term. That's why we want these parameters to be quite small. They, were, they should be smaller than 1 over n minus 1. That's what we usually not, need not be, but usually assume that's a good assumption. Also, usually B1 is bigger than A1. That means the unhappiness that you get from being behind is bigger than the unhappiness that you get from being ahead, which is, again, plausible. So this is a very simple assumption. It's a simple model based on some assumption. It worked very well. Now, with that model, let us return to the Hassani approach. Maybe you remember Hassani did utilitarianism, where you take the average utility of other people, but you don't pay any attention to inequality, the feelings or things like that, fairness feelings. Many people have criticized the model for it. It was a typical example that people used to criticize it. They say, look at the left society, and so here we assume only two persons in society, two agents. Left and right society, the average expect them, we assume um, linear utility, you know, fresh we keep it simple so then the expected utility in both societies is half for both agents but then according to our son you know, both societies are equally good equally much happiness in total but many people say that's not the case because here there's always equality and fairness and that's fine but here there's always inequality and fairness here there's more unhappiness they should not be considered equivalent well with the Schmidt model, we can quite easily accommodate that. And in fact, you, know, you can immediately see you don't need calculations for it because you know, here you just have the welfare terms, all the inequality terms are zero. Let me have the symbols of equality, inequality, there they are. Anyway, here you have the no inequality terms, so that's it. But here, besides the welfare of people themselves, you also have these negative inequality terms coming. So immediately you can see with fish meat, this will be less than that. But I still present a bit more in detail the calculation, so we get used to this model and we see how it works. So there we go. So first we look at the left situation and we let's assume the how it is with agent one. Let's assume you are agent one. That means in the upper situation, your welfare, the first term is one, that's just how much money you have, you touch the linear. But the other terms, the inequality term, they are all zero, there is no inequality. So the, the happiness of you is just one. If we look at the lowest situation, your agent one, your welfare is zero, that's the first term, but again, there is no inequality. So all the inequality terms are zero, so your happiness is simply zero and that's it. So then if we calculate the expected utility with probability 0 0.5 times one, plus 0.5 times zero. So in total, the expected utility for agent one is 0.5 in that situation. Agent two, the same, also 0.5. Now we go to the right situation. Again, we assume you're agent one. We look at this upper situation. Your welfare is one. That's the first term. But now there is an inequality aversion term and the difference is one and you are ahead. So minus A1 times one is the inequality that the uh, term that comes in that reduces your happiness. If you look at the lowest situation, your welfare is zero. There is an inequality of one, but now you're behind. So minus B1 times one is the inequality aversion term that comes in. So in total, your, your happiness is minus B1 here. And then the expected utility is the, the probability 0 0.5 multiplied by these things. Then it is 0 0.5 minus these uh, two inequality aversion terms 
uh, divided by two coming in. And of course, these are negative terms. So your expected, the expected of agent one is less in the, the, the right situation than in the left situation where it was this agent two, the same story. Both agents are more happy in the left situation and in the right situation. So any social planner should also prefer left to right. So that's how Fairshmeet can really easily accommodate that inequality version that Hassanji did not. And you may remember that this is not the end of the debate because Hassanji could say, well, uh, you, you are not writing the right utility here. If inequality makes the agent more unhappy here, the utility should be less than one. And then people can say, yeah, but if you do that, your model is not tractable and more can be debated. But let's not continue on that. But at least you can see that with fish meat, you can very easily, readily model the inequality version that's empirically very realistic and that many people think that is normatively desirable. Uh, but uh, surely empirically, behaviorally, it's happening. So that's how Fairschmidt can uh, solve these things. Now, there are several other models for, uh, for inequality of version that are competing with the Fairschmidt model, but we will not discuss them. I will later in this uh, course uh, today, in last meeting, <laughs> an application of the Fairschmidt model to game theory. That will come later. But now I want to uh, go on. This was the end of chapter six. Now I go to chapter seven, the more fundamental breakaways in uh, due to behavioral findings, where the review preference paradigm is relaxed, where you work with data, not just choice based. There will be two sections. First, Kahneman's work on experience utility for intertemporal evaluations, and then the happiness studies. I start with Kahneman's experience utility model. So this is about uh, time durations, how you evaluate episodes in your life. Maybe you had a vacation of one month, how much happiness did it give you? How much do you like it uh, in your memory? And uh, many anomalies have been found there and they have to do with the perception of time duration is especially difficult. There's time duration neglect. That's one of the biases. So all kind of paradoxes, anomalies uh, are found when you do reveal preference, uh, observable choice so much that Kahneman said there are situations in which you should absolutely not use reveal preference data. They are too much bias, too much noisy. There's too much going on there. We better use just introspection. The thing that psychologists use much, but also for economic questions, it's, it's better sometimes to use that. So uh, he said uh, this introspective utility for uh, intertemporal evaluations of episodes. For instance, a big study that he did it was uh, published in Science around 2018, where many subjects, they uh, a few times per day, they got a, a message from their smartphone and they uh, had to answer. The question was asked them, how happy are you feeling at the moment? Then they could give a score between zero and seven or whatever it was, indicating the level of happiness at that moment then such data was used. And you notice the, such data have nothing to do with observable choice, it's just introspection. And also, but also they don't have to do with memory. Each time people only report the utility feeling at that moment, because memory is also twisting time perception, uh, all these things. So kind of said, let's stay away from that. We only measure utilities that are experienced at the very moment when they are experienced. That's the only data we use. So they got a bit data set like that. They could use it to uh, explain and describe all kinds of things. And it was used also questions relevant to economics. So they showed that was one of the many demonstrations that it may, it's good, uh, it's, it's getting time that economists relax on the uh, revealed preference uh, paradigm. So this was a fundamental breakaway from ordinal, from this ordinal approach, real preference approach. And there is, well, uh, I can't call it behavioral fund. There has been a paper, but I like to cite it. I wrote, uh, co-authored it, so I'd like to mention it. That gave axioms that make this model more appealing and more convincing, maybe. Although this axiom did not refer to observable choice, but to other things, just direct evaluations. Anyway, let's now go to section 7.2, happiness studies. They are a bit like Kahneman using uh, introspection, direct experience, but they are not restricted to intertemporal evaluation of time periods of durations, but uh, more broadly. And they may ask in several countries, uh, many people, they ask how happy are you on a scale from zero to seven? And they see in which country the average happiness is bigger. And they discuss whether rich countries are more happy than poor countries. All these kinds of things are being done. Many people are full-time working on it. It's a big field. And um, well, 
And it, it, I am in a Timbergen institution that's a research institution combining Amsterdam and Rotterdam and Timbergen institution has done a lot on this. And for instance, there was uh, Bernard van Praag. He is a, he now retired, but he was influential economist in the Timberg Institute, also in Holland, and he had also worldwide publications. And he was very influential for Dutch uh, politics, for instance. Here is the title of his 1968 PhD thesis. So he wrote this when he was at the age of many of the listeners to this recording, I assume, when a young guy. In that, he argued that economists should not just use revealed preference, but they should often use introspective data for us to evaluate how happy people are with their income. So in those, this is 1968, mind you, way before the behavioral approach started, but he already had such ideas. Well, in those days, those ideas were not very popular. And many people said, this is nonsense. We don't want to hear it. This is not economics. So many people didn't want to listen. Then if, especially as a young researcher, you have to find his way, you want to be able to survive. You need a special personality, the personality like Bernard van Praag had. He was very headstrong. He could do it. He persisted and he had a good career because he had this strong will <laughs> and a strong intellect. So he could do it. Now, I am in a lucky situation that at young age, when I was the age maybe of many listeners now, I could take a course from Bernard van Praag. And I was in Leiden University, Bernard taught there, so I took a course from him. So at a young age, I was really exposed to such ideas that real preference time or the paradigm also economics may be too narrow. And I think I was really lucky that from young age on, I've been exposed to such ideas and that helped me to be better prepared to work in this field today. And I had the intellectual debt to Bernard van Praag. So I'm happy, uh, I was lucky to be in this part of the world. Uh, continuing uh, on this part uh, of the world. Well, here first, here's the book uh, by Be uh, book 2004, Bernard van Praag and Ada Fer e. Carbonell, uh, also one of the most cited researchers in uh, the Timberg Institute in those days, when well, now she's in Spain. But an influential book it was. But uh, I was talking about this part of the world. I am located in Rotterdam. It's a bit to the south of Amsterdam. <laughs> and the Timberg Institute also. There is in Rotterdam with Ruth Veenhoven. He has for many years also been pushing this happiness studies. He had a big data base, uh, data set of studies on happiness. And he, he set up a center here, the Hero Center, where they use happiness. So they do a lot of applied work going on right now. So there's a lot of that going on, and especially in this little part of the world where I am. But uh, this is the end of part two. Now I saw the theories. Now I go to part three applications, but that will be in the next recording. So uh, to be continued.